Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone. If I can open it up with a small dua. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yomidin, Yakan Abudu, Yakan Astain, Edina Sarant al Mustakim, Sarant al Razin and Amta Alain, Bairam Madubi Alim al Dolim Amin. Faisal, if you can just uh, show me your video, if you can. Okay, thank you. Um, Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I see there's one hand up. Uh, if they can just post the comments onto the Q&A. Uh, I'm speaking to you as a representative of uh, the Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers. The name is Shabiri Chohan. I'm going to hand you over um, to the moderator today, Faisal Suleiman. Before I hand you over, just I'm delighted that we could come together to provide a very, very important webinar, uh, which Faisal will introduce a bit later. The Association of Muslim Accountants and Lawyers, we teamed up with Minara. Uh, the association itself was established way back in 1980 to bring very relevant topics to our, our members. And we have uh, engaged on a number of topics over the last couple of years. And I must thank the people that have created AMAL way back in uh, 1980s. So thank you very much to them. AMAL is a organization mainly for accountants and lawyers, and not just only for Muslims. It's available to everyone. And in fact, we do have members who are not of the Islamic faith. So please do join if you can. And I'm going to hand you over to Faisal Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum to all and welcome to this very important presentation this morning. Our country has experienced unprecedented mayhem over the past week, however. Inspired together, united to deal with this. It is appropriate that now we deal with this aftermath and try and rebuild. Almighty has assured us that after every hardship comes ease. Particularly is to try and assist businesses. In this slide, we've uh, brought together a few speakers. Mm -hmm. I'll introduce the first speaker, uh, Mr. Siddiq Isaacs. He is the head of business support services at Company Limited, that previously was known as Zurich Insurance. He heads up the couple operations, the Islamic insurance aspect for Bright South Africa, and has a special interest in this very important product. Is an associate of IISA and CII of London and has completed several leadership and management programs and has been in the insurance industry for the past 37 years. He has also served as deputy CEO of OCA SA. I now hand you over to Siddiq. Jazakallah Faisal for that introduction and um, assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and good morning to everyone. And um, before I go into the presentation, uh, thanks to Shabir and the team for inviting us to, to share some information with you. I also bring you wishes, well wishes from the CEO and the executive of Bright and also their prayers and thoughts over the people and our staff of uh, KwaZulu Natal, our, our thoughts and prayers are certainly with with everyone at this point in time, and um, we certainly will will see whatever we can do from a bright perspective to assist and to help the people of uh, KwaZulu Natal. So this morning, um, I've been asked to talk about the uh, current circumstances, and I I thought it was appropriate maybe just to share some information around the background of uh, the formation of SASRIA, who are the um, supporters from an insurance perspective in terms of the current circumstances we find ourselves in where insurance is concerned. SASRIA is, is the sort of backbone of the insurance industry when it comes to political riots and standard rights. So I'll do a little bit of a, a background of SASRIA and then talk through some of the things that they provide, how people and businesses will be covered. And um, we can then obviously do some questions at the end. So I'm just gonna share my screen. If somebody can just please indicate when you are able to see my screen.
Siddiq, we can see your screen. You can go ahead. Is it is it the full screen at the moment? Yes, the full screen is showing. Thank you. All right, so just do a bit of an agenda, just a bit of background on the Sastri uh, history. Some of the covers that is available under Sastri under the current circumstances, the types of perils that Sastri provides, the extensions of cover, some uninsurable extensions as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about claims and some questions. So if we look at the history of Sastrio, uh, prior to 1979, the standard and the conventional insurance market in South Africa offered cover for riots. And um, then there was no differentiation between what was political and what was sort of uh, a non-political type of riot or strikes or anything of that nature. During the mid 70s, obviously, as everybody would be aware of the escalation in violence and the types of unrest that took place following the 1976 uh, Soweto student riots, there was obviously engagement around with the insurance industry in terms of how do they solve the situation going forward? Because for insurance companies, it obviously be became pro problematic with the quantum of damages um, and the amounts that had to be paid out um, obviously was, was way beyond what insurance companies were reinsured for or were able to sort of contribute from their net line. And uh, because of these incidents and because of the enormity of the size of these um, uh, amounts and the quantums of the claims, there was an engagement with the South African Insurance Association and um, through this engagement, it resulted in the formation of SASRIA as we know them today, known as the South African Special Risks Insurance Association. At the moment, uh, they are the only insurer who are authorized to underwrite political risks. But when they started out in the 70s, the loss limit was a mere 50,000 that they introduced as a loss. So it was quite small and um, and obviously, from that point onward, when we look towards the 80s, the loss limit increased to 200 million. The standard riots were covered by insurers at that point in time, and the political riots were covered by SASRIA. So they were covering an amount of up to about 200 million. And um, then during the 80s, there was a further engagement with SASRIA to take over completely all of the types of political and non-political events that, that uh, would, would come about, whether it was just an ordinary standard type, as, as we know it as standard riot, meaning it's non-political um, and public disorder. And Sassia then agreed at that point in time to take over all forms of political and non-political riot um, and, and they would then cover those events. So during Siddiq, the 90s, sorry, if I may just uh, disturb you, it's just the cover your main slide is showing. Uh, I'm not sure if you've advanced it to any other slides. That's not coming through. I uh, have. It's, it's, okay, actually, it's just your main slide that uh, says Sastria cover and claims that's displaying. Uh, then, okay, then it's not moving on, on your side. Okay, let me just see if I can try and do something here again. If you want to just uh, stop sharing and try sharing again without going for the full screen, maybe. Okay. Let me just see if I can. Participants, we do apologize for this. Sorry about that. I'm just going to take it down quickly, if you don't mind, because I'm having a little bit of a problem here. Okay, try sharing again and maybe just leave it and move it manually if you have to. I'm just going to try and open it again. Sorry about that.
maybe just move it manually for the time being. Uh, so we're on the first slide, statutory cover and claims, but whichever slide you're speaking from, maybe manually go into that. Okay, we've got the agenda on the screen. Ah, okay. That's fine. Thank can, you. can you hear me now at the moment? Um, yes, we can hear you clearly. And the agenda okay. sc screen, yes, thank you. Okay, now let me just go to, I, I think it was- The 90s the... screen is on, 1990s, uh, or you know, go up to- Okay, so let's go back to okay. 80. So it's fine, we can go ahead. Apologies for that. Um, okay, so so when we talk about the, the 80s, again, Sassia looked at increasing the uh, limits to about 200 million. As I think I mentioned that start, standard rights were covered by the insurers. And then with further engagement with Sassria, Sassria then agreed to take over all of the uh, riots, which was then political and non-political riots. And it obviously includes things like public disorder as well. If we then go to the 90s, um, further increases to the uh, loss limit, so just to give you a sense of how these loss limits were actually increasing to where we are today, you'll see it in, in a minute. Sassio then converted to a limited company and then became a wholly owned subsidiary of the South African government at that point in time, which means that South Africa, um, uh, the Sassio is, an, is a government organization supported by the government in terms of their current insurance um, facilities and their operations. Then during the two uh, the 2000 years, loss limit increased to a primary of 500 million. And they also introduced a wraparound cover for an additional 1 billion. So at the moment, you can actually insure for up to 1.5 billion with Sassria on an individual uh, location or a, a set of companies can insure for up to 1.5 billion. If an organization needs more than 1.5 billion, then you would have to go to the open market and buy additional cover, which is available. And, and it's what they call riot wraparound ground up, which means that you can then go, go and buy above the 1.5 million outside of Sassvia. So new covers were introduced during the years of 2000 uh, up to where we are today. At a point in time, there was no business interruption cover, meaning that if the business became embroiled in any of these circumstances and, and had any losses, they didn't provide business interruption. Then now you have business interruption cover. Some of the motor covers were enhanced to provide better covers. And all in all, um, Sassaria has certainly improved over the years to be able to provide the exact covers that are required. However, there are certain covers that are not provided for, and we'll touch on, on some of those a bit later on. So when we look at what does Sassaria cover provide right now, they provide for material damage. So meaning that fires, damage to premises, um, et cetera, they cover money that is either at the premises or in transit. They also cover goods in transit. And as we, we've seen, the horrific scenes of trucks being burnt and looted, that is exactly what they would cover in terms of the goods in transit. And the motor cover would cover the trucks uh, that, that were burnt uh, and looted on, on the highways. The business interruption cover is there, as I mentioned. So that covers the business uh, during a period of time following uh, the material damage um, to provide them with uh, an income um, for a certain period of time as per the policy um, provided. And then there is also construction risk. Um, that is where buildings are being constructed. Um, there are projects. And uh, for the period of the project, the construction risk is covered under SASRIA. So those are the sort of basic covers provided by uh, SASRIA at this point in time to a business, to individuals, uh, it is their homes and their motor vehicles and things like that that are covered. And, but essentially this is what is provided for businesses at this point in time. 
when we look at access to SASRI in terms of how does one get the SASRI cover and how do you get access to them because it is a government organization. So SASRI does not do direct business with anyone. They don't, you, you're not able to go and buy a SASRI cover directly from them. You have to go through an insurance agent. The insurance agent is insurance companies like Bright, Suntum, Hollard, um, and all of the other direct insurance companies, they're all agents of SASRIA and therefore brokers are able to buy the cover on behalf of clients, on behalf of organizations through the insurers into SASRIA. They are, they are, the, the, the agents are authorized to issue those policies on behalf of SASRIA. SASRIA provides a set of regulations. They provide the guidelines. They provide the premiums and all of that is regulated by them. So the agent issues the SASRIA coupon, collects the premiums and passes that premium on to SASRIA who are in control of the covers and in control of the premiums. The brokers, they are, inter the, 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 they are either um, termed brokers or intermediaries. They have access to the insurance companies and they place the business on behalf of the insured or the client or in Takaful terms, we call it the participant. So the brokers are there to assist. The brokers are there to give guidance. They should understand the rules around SASRIA, what SASRIA provides for, what it does not provide for. But more importantly, the broker is also there to give guidance on insurance as a whole because even though SASRIA covers are limited, the insurance company provides for a vast array of different covers as what is known as the underlying policy. So in the past, SASRIA only dealt with um, the insurers who have underlying policies. So if you had an underlying policy, you could have SASRIA. Today, it is a little bit different in terms of the fact that SASRIA do allow for standalone covers, meaning that you could come to Bright, you could ask for a, a SASRIA coupon to be issued, even though Bright does not have the underlying policy. That is uh, because SASRIA is now a fully fledged underwriter. And so we would go to SASRIA, ask them to approve, they would approve it and we issue a policy, even though there's no underlying insurance with a, an insurance company. The availability of cover, what is important to understand is that the cover is available anywhere in South Africa only. Now, that is very important because you have other forms of government organized cover in other countries. For example, when you go to uh, Namibia, then you take out what is called Nazria cover. So they provide for the, the, the similar type of cover that you have in South Africa. So when you cross into Namibia, you need to take out that form of cover if you're entering a country like Namibia. When you're entering any other uh, African state or country, you'd have to inquire as to what covers are available within those states and those countries to be able to have the proper cover when entering those territories. It's issued via a broker and via an insurer, as I explained earlier on. And uh, generally there is an, a, a policy with an insurer. So in most cases, you will find that the, the, the underlying cover is placed with a company like Bright, where there is a full on policy where we cover fire, business interruption, uh, theft, money, liability covers, uh, there's, there's a host of other covers, goods in transit, glass, et cetera. And all of those make up the underlying policy. So for the SASRIA part, the underlying insurer then issues the SASRIA cover as well via the broker. So that is probably the most prevalent situation is that the insurer of the underlying policy issues the SASRIA cover at the same time. There, there are specific rules and regulations that govern how those policies can be issued um, and, and around what criteria, what rules there are in place, what exclusions there are. It's very similar to how an insurance company issues a policy. Um, and so they're very specific and, and those rules are shared with the brokers 
and with the uh, insuring agent uh, insurance companies as well. And, and as I mentioned earlier on, cover can now also be underwritten on a standalone basis. So um, you can take out a motor vehicle on its own without having to do anything else with uh, an insurance company for that purpose. If we then look at what are the pedals that are covered, because this comes pretty much home in terms of what circumstances are prevailing at the moment. So the accessory of pedals that they cover, and it's referred to as pedals, but it's incidents uh, that take place. It covers civil commotion, um, precisely what is, what is happening at the moment um, in terms of a mixture of the political and the non-political because of the element that, is, that has gotten involved. It does also extend to cover labor disturbances, lockout in terms of uh, issues where that is prevalent, public disorder, riots, which is the political and non-political riots, strikes and uh, acts of terrorism are all encompassed now within the Sassaria cover and the perils that are covered by Sassaria. And it's important to, to, to understand this part quite clearly because this is the critical part in terms of the current covers and the current things that are actually taking place. Because there are certain things that Sassaria covers and then there's certain things that the underlying policy covers. And, and that must be clearly distinguished from one and the other. So if we look at, for example, what, what is the most prevalent thing that has now taken place across KZN and in Gauteng is the looting part. Now, looting is covered, but providing there's a peril that has taken place. Now, one needs to understand this quite clearly in terms of the fact that an underlying policy covers theft. Sassaria does not cover theft. They do not provide cover for theft. So if a group of, of, of people just walked into a place, held up a place and, and, and stole goods from them, that would not be covered in terms of Sassaria. That would be covered in terms of the standard insurance policy of the insurance company. Looting is what we refer to when a riot has taken place, whether it be of a political nature or of a non-political nature. And looting would be covered following one of the perils. So where a place has been attacked, where it's been burnt and then looted, that would be covered if Sazria accepts the liability in terms of the fact they agree that in terms of the circumstances, there was a riot, there was political motivation or there was no political motivation. There was a fire, there was damage to the premises as we referred to the perils. And uh, there's an active peril that has actually taken place. It follows that peril. And on that basis, Sassaria will accept liability. So when one looks at the current circumstances that has prevailed, generally, Sassaria would accept that liability of looting because it has been followed by a peril which is covered by Sassaria, which is the public disorder, it is the riot, it is the fire that has taken place. And so in general, Sassaria would sort of follow along those lines. And I think you may have heard some of the comments from Sassaria during the course of this week on television. At the same time, there are one or two extensions and one of the, the key extensions that can be bought is what is called security costs. And so they allow for up to an amount of 10 million that can be bought. Now this again is linked to a fire peril or contract works only. So you can't just get an extension for security costs for any circumstance. It has to be linked to a fire peril. That fire peril must be taking place either um, within a very close proximity or within a 10 kilometer radius of your premises. So what would happen is Sassaria would provide cover for you to contract security to protect your premises because for them, it would be more important that your premises is protected and therefore they would be prepared to provide costs upfront to save anything from happening to that particular premises. So they provide about 10 million rands worth of costs um, for, uh, for, for that particular circumstance. If you need more than 10 million, 
then you would have to go again to the open market to buy cover over and above the 10 million. But what is important is that it is available. And so you can actually, if you've got that kind of cover, it means where there is any riots taking place within the 10 kilometer vicinity, you are able to, be, to bring on board security that will secure your premises um, within the Sasphere ambit of their covers. So I think quite an important extension, particularly at this point in time, as, as things are unfolding and, and hopefully everything comes to a stop sooner rather than later for, for, for the benefit of all. There are some uninsurable extensions as with every policy um, because Sasria operates pretty much similar to an insurance company in terms of how they underwrite. They've also got reinsurers that provide certain conditions and certain terms um, because not everything is 100% is underwritten by Sasria. They reinsure a lot of that onto the open market and uh, with the reinsurance comes certain uh, regulations and certain extensions that, do, uh, that are uninsurable. So some of those uninsurable extensions includes fines and penalties, prevention of access where you are prevented from entering an area, SASIA will not cover that, public utilities, things that are affected from a, com a, a, com a municipality perspective, public telecommunications would not be covered, uh, an accountant's clause in terms of anything to do with the claim in terms of preparation thereof, an accumulated stock clause, and then incompatibility cover where one is trying to uh, make things equal in terms of certain types of things. And if an example there would be from an electronic equipment point of view, they would not upgrade and neither would they try to make things compatible. Um, that is not within the ambit of the covers that they provide. So those are just some of the uninsurable extensions that, that, that um, SASVIA do not cover. From a claims perspective, if one looks at the current circumstances, how would one deal with claims? It is handled by the insurance companies up front. So again, your claim doesn't go to SASVIA directly. If you've, if you've been dealing with a broker or an insurer, your claim is handed over to the broker. The broker will hand that claim over to the insurer with all the details that go with it. Now, importantly here is to understand that when, when you're handing over that particular claim to the broker, you need to provide full details of what has taken place. You would need to provide evidence uh, of the uh, quantum and the amount of claim that you are placing with, uh, um, with the insurer via, via the insurer to SASVIA. The insurer is allowed to settle small individual claims which SASVIA uh, mandates them and authorizes them to do. They give us uh, a certain small mandate to be able to settle claims immediately, small claims, so that clients don't have to wait and they can actually get on with, with some of the things the, the larger claims are registered with the insurer. There's a, there's a pre-investigation that takes place at the insurer level. They look at all the, the key things that need to be provided. They will talk to the broker. They will um, engage the broker, liaise with the broker, get all the information that is required. The insurer will then investigate and pass that information to SASVIA. Sastria will look at that uh, claim. They will, they will assess the claim, so to speak. They may want to send people out to the premises to go and have a look at the premises, to adjust it in terms of seeing exactly what has transpired um, and, and, and to quantify the loss as well. If it's a big loss, they would want to quantify that loss to be able to understand quite clearly exactly what the quantum, what, what the amount of that claim is, and then they will make the decision at SASVIA whether to accept or reject liability in terms of that claim. Now, that is important because even though uh, you, the, the, the broker or the client may have worked through an insurer, the insurer does not make any decision when it comes to a SASVIA claim. And the simple reason for that is that 
an insurer does not provide the statutory cover. There's a specific exclusion within the policy that exclude any form of statutory cover that has been covered um, or taken out via SASRI. So in, in the process, um, SASRI, as I said, will have the, um, the, the, the right to visit the premises. They will also have the right to the salvage at the premises. So for example, if there are stocks at the premises that have been smoke damaged or whatever and can be salvaged in terms of cleanup and, 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 and to make use of it, it is within their rights to, to claim the salvage and pay out the insured for whatever they have actually taken. So whatever they pay for, they have the right to claim the salvage out of that situation. Importantly, from a claim perspective, is that like an insurer, SASRIA will require proof of the event that has taken place. They would require proof of quantum. So they may ask for various accounting documents and uh, receipts, proof of all the uh, uh, claims uh, that, that is being um, requested in terms of that, those particular amounts. Um, they are within their rights to obviously require and request all that proof. They will, uh, in, in, in a lot of the instances where it's big claims, follow uh, up with an assessor's report or potentially an investigator's report as well. If they believe that it, it is a necessity to have an investigator, it is again within their rights to appoint an investigator to have a look at the specific claims and to investigate. So we've covered uh, um, quite a number of aspects there in a short period of time. Um, there is obviously a lot more involved in the regulatory side, in the, in the actual wording that is provided. And um, it does go into a, a, a lot more detail where required, depending on the type of business. But importantly, from a business perspective, it, it, it gives a sense of the fact that with these kinds of political and, 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 and standard rights, there is an organization that can provide the cover. It is not covered within a standard insurance type policy, but the opportunity is there. And for the current circumstances, one would possibly ask one or two uh, questions, and, and you may have a few other questions um, at the end of the presentation. This, this is virtually my, my sort of last slide around uh, the, the, the whole issue of the covers being provided from an insurance perspective. You may have a few other questions. From our side, um, if you ask the, uh, the, the question, I have insurance, do I need SASRIA cover? The answer is an absolute yes. If one looks at this current circumstance, without SASRIA cover, regrettably, the insured would not have cover for what is actually taking place at the moment. How much would I be covered for in, in this kind of situation? So it's not a blanket cover. It's, you know, um, if, you are, if you are carrying stocks of a million or two million, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're covered for the full amount of it. You need to ensure that you have taken the full amount of cover at Sassaria. So if you're carrying 2 million rands worth of stocks, then 2 million rand is what you should be insuring for so that in the event of a claim, you are then protected for that full 2 million rand. And that is important because what we do find is that sometimes businesses are insured for a million. They're carrying 2 million rands worth of stock. They've only insured for a million. At the end of the day, SASRIA is not going to pay the two million. They're only going to cover you for a portion of that loss relative to what you have insured for. So that is critical to understand. It is called average in terms of insurance and they will pay out the percentage relative to what you have insured. So it is important that going forward, please, uh, to uh, it's an important message to spread to everyone to ensure that what they're insuring for is the full replacement value or retail value of what they are actually insuring. That is very important. Um, how much would I get indemnified? If you had an underlying policy, it will follow that sum insured of the underlying policy. And as I mentioned, 
The important aspect is to ensure for the full value, the underlying policy carries the full value, Sassaria should carry the full value, and hopefully in those circumstances, the, the business or the organization should have the proper cover in place and should be fully covered from a Sassaria perspective. I touched on one or two things earlier, but what does Sassaria typically not cover? So typically, they do not cover looting and theft, but they cover looting following the peril, as I mentioned earlier on, that is damage or fire. And, and in that instance, the looting that follows would then be covered. But pure theft and looting is not covered without one of those uh, uh, incidents or covered events taking place. Property that is confiscated by the law. So here you find in these circumstances, it's going to be a situation of where the law has, has taken possession of certain things that would not be covered by Sassaria it, it, um, and, and cannot be claimed for directly. The looting is covered, but if the law takes possession of something for a particular reason, the property confiscated by the law would not be covered under Sassaria. Deliberate slowing down of work uh, where the organization slows everything down and then uh, ends up with a business interruption loss would not typically be covered under Sassaria policy. One of the other important things that, that also needs to be understood is when these riots are taking place and businesses decide to close by themselves, even though there's been no um, damage to their premises, but because of the fear of something happening and they close the premises, that is not covered from a business interruption point of view. If you've made that decision on your own to close the, the business down, typically it is not covered under a Sassaria policy. The other question, um, and this is an important question, and I think I've touched on it a bit earlier, if I do not have Sassaria cover, will my underlying insurance policy pay? The, Unfortunate thing is, regrettably, that underlying insurance policy excludes all forms of political or standard drive. So an underlying standard policy with an insurer will not typically respond to anything that is related to political or standard rights that would be covered by Sassaria. So I've covered, I think, um, the, the essential items that is provided by um, Sassaria in terms of the current unrest situation. And, um, and I'm sure you've probably got a few questions that you'd like to ask as well. And um, I'm sure we'll allow some questions at the end of, of the program. And I'm happy to take some questions at the end of the program. So that sort of covers us in terms of uh, the Sassaria part and the part that uh, uh, from an insurer's insurance perspective would be sort of uh, covered in terms of what is currently happening within the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. Siddiq Isaacs for that excellent presentation. We have a number of questions and I think like you said, we'll address it at the end after uh, all the presentations have been completed. Please can all um, not place these questions on the chat, but place it on the Q&A so that we can coordinate all of those questions. Um, our next presenter is uh, no stranger to Amal Minara and most of our people. Um, Yasmin Suleiman is a chartered accountant and is a senior executive partner at uh, Bowman's. And she's been offering her services to us over many years. I think probably 10 years would be a good estimate. Um, so she's going to present on the tax matters. Uh, relating to in these insurance claims and, and all related uh, aspects of it. So I hand over now to uh, Yasmin. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Uh, good morning to those of you that are not Muslims on the call. So just, uh, if, you can, if you can just uh, unshare your screen. Thank you. Sorry Yasmin. No problem. I'm going to start sharing my screen as well. Hopefully it works. Um, can you see the screen at all? 
Not yet, uh, yes, ma'am. Not yet. Okay, let me uh, reopen it. Let's try again. Share screen. There we go. Is it sharing now? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay, good. I'm going to leave it in this format so you guys can see me moving the slides as well. Um, I wish I was talking to you guys under better circumstances. Um, it's been a very traumatic time over the last week. Um, I don't think any of us have really recovered. Um, and it almost seems strange to talk about things like, like tax when there are more important things going on in the world. Um, but I think it's important to highlight certain things that uh, you know, businesses need to be aware of. Um, I think the previous presentation was probably more important because you know, it's really going to have a direct impact on, on whether businesses survive, whether they have su sufficient cover, could they recover some of their losses and so on. But I think here, what we're trying to do is, uh, it, uh, is give some understanding of what the tax implications are that uh, you know, businesses need to be aware of. You know, it's not going to be immediately important necessarily, um, you know, because most businesses are in survival mode now, but you guys need to be aware uh, of certain things that either uh, could be detrimental or could be an opportunity. Um, so, and, and something to bear in mind when it comes to the time of having to submit returns and so on, the, these are the kinds of things you need to take into account. Now, tax is not a very pleasant sort of topic. And unfortunately, some of the things I have to say today are probably not very pleasant. So I just want to cover tax compliance first. Uh, you know, just because we've gone through this um, traumatic event doesn't mean to say your tax compliance obligations fall away, right? So the obligations to submit returns, to make tax payments and so on uh, still exists. Um, if you think back, you know, this, this event, these events happened over the last week, which is sort of middle of the, the month. Um, and most businesses had a full month of trading in June. Um, and if you registered for VAT as an example, you still have to submit your VAT return at the end of July. If you, um, you know, if you have employees, you still would have had to submit your PAYE return by the end of July, as, um, by the 7th of July as well. So, you know, there's a, there, there is a, an, an obligation to submit returns and make payments to SARS. Now, um, it is possible <clears throat> if the, the business is under uh, quite a bit of, uh, <clears throat> sorry, a bit of um, stress in terms of money being lost um, and not having sufficient money, it may be possible to request a payment plan for taxes due or returns submitted. And I think in this regard, SARS would be quite understanding. Um, I haven't seen any communication from SARS um, on, on these particular events over the last week, but I expect that there will be a lot more understanding of, uh, of taxpayers that have been impacted. Now, obviously, uh, you know, SARS, I don't think is going to give us a, a, a blanket sort of, um, um, I would say, a relief. Uh, I mean, we saw it with COVID as well, uh, that there were certain things that were offered to all taxpayers, and then there were others where you had to request, make requests, special requests, and so on. And I suspect in this case, it's going to be on a case by case basis that they would provide relief. Um, the other thing too that is possible is it is possible to request remission of late payment penalties and interest due to circumstances. So if you submit your return but simply do not have the means to pay it, um, you know, I think SARS would be quite understanding in terms of the late payment penalties and the interest due. So, you know, again, uh, it's probably going to be based on, um, uh, on submissions to SARS. I don't think it's going to be a blanket thing. You probably have to uh, uh, make a request to SARS. Um, uh, for the penalties and the interest to be waived. And then for tax, tax debt that is owing, uh, but basically cannot be serviced. Uh, I think it's going to be possible to ask for a compromise of the debt, uh, the tax debt owing to SARS. Um, I think some businesses are probably um, not insured or not adequately insured and may end up in quite a tight position, especially if they want to rebuild. And, you know, I, I think submissions can be made to SARS to compromise on some of the debt. Compromise means that SARS will forgive you some of the tax debt that needs to be paid. But obviously, they will want a lot of information on your financial position first before they can make that call. Another important aspect is lost records. Now, a lot of businesses, especially small and medium businesses, uh, you know, they would keep their records on their premises 
I may not necessarily have offsite, uh, off-site storage or storage in the cloud or computer systems that are, that are a bit more sophisticated. And what do you do in that case? Now, I mean, it's a situation we've, we've come across before where we've had clients that have been impacted by fires or floods or, uh, you know, similar kind of events. And essentially there, I mean, what you need to do is to make your best effort uh, based on third party information that you can obtain to reconstruct your records as far as possible. Now, given the circumstances, it may well be that you will not have a full accounting of, of all your records, um, and, but you'll need a reasonable basis to come up with an estimate. Now, if I can give you an example, I mean, most businesses traded for a full month in June. And if you had to submit a return at the, for the period ended June, a VAT return, um, you know, you'd, you'd have to make some kind of estimate of what VAT needs to be paid during the month of July. And if those records have been lost, do you need some method of, of coming up with the number that needs to be submitted to SARS? I spoke to one of my colleagues that is uh, very uh, you know, involved in tax administration matters. And the suggestion is that prior to submitting the return, as far as possible, write to SARS on their standard email addresses that they use for communication to let them know that you're going to be making an estimate. So don't just submit your return with an estimate in it. So, so write to them in advance of the, the return being submitted and saying, look, I've been, I'm in this situation, um, I don't have any records. This is the basis on which I am going to be quantifying uh, the tax, either uh, the tax payable uh, for this period and, and give them a, de a, a deadline by which they need to respond. Now, chances are SARS is not going to respond in time. Uh, you know, given the scenario, I mean, they're it, probably going to have a large uh, volume of, um, of requests to, to deal with. And, um, you know, they're probably not going to respond in time, but at least you've, you've done your bit in terms of sending them a notification in advance. So when you do submit your return, it's not like you did not do it with any thought of what SARS will say, because we do have provisions in the, uh, in the uh, Tax Administration Act that allow for estimates to be agreed with a senior SARS official. The problem is, unless you're a really large taxpayer and fall within the large business center, you're probably not going to have that face-to-face -face contact with, with, with a person at SARS. And with COVID and SARS working remotely, chances are you're only going to be able to contact them via their call center or through their email, um, in their email contacts. Now, moving on to losses. The first thing I want to cover is uninsured losses. And from what, uh, what was said in the previous presentation, I think we're going to have a, a, a lot of cases where a lot of the losses are actually uninsured. Right. Now, what do you do? I mean, you've incurred this loss. Uh, what, what, what happens from a tax perspective? Now, from an income tax perspective, uh, the loss of stock uh, through theft or damage effectively becomes a tax deduction because you had it on hand. Uh, you, you obviously claimed the deduction and now you can't include it in closing stock. So effectively, that, uh, that becomes a deduction for income tax purposes. If the stock still exists, and is salvageable. Uh, so you can you know, maybe get 20% of the cost price back uh, through selling it uh, you know, uh, at a discount to the, uh, to the public or through scrapping it. Then you can write down the stock to its current market value and effectively you'll get a deduction relate, um, you know, e equivalent to the write down of the value of the stock. When it comes to assets which are depreciable assets, so things like um, shelving, tills, heisters, trucks, uh, you know, those kinds of assets, but not buildings. Uh, and those were lost or destroyed. You know, scrapping allowances may be claimed on those assets. So in whatever is undepreciated cost that's still left over uh, at the end of your previous financial year, you can take as a deduction in the current year. When it comes to the cost of repairs um, or reinstating uh, your, uh, your premises or reinstating your equipment uh, to its current so, so to its previous condition or it's, you know, to reinstate it to, what it, uh, to a workable condition would be deductible in the year you actually inc incur that, those ex that expenditure. So if you had to, for example, if the premises was burnt, you need to, needed to, uh, you know, um, and it wasn't completely destroyed and you needed to maybe replace the roof, uh, repaint the walls, uh, re uh, you know, um, maybe redo the flooring and so on, all those costs would qualify as repairs and should be claimable in the year that those the, the expenditure was actually incurred. Then, I mean, even if a business was not impacted uh, directly uh, through the through these events, you know, uh, you know, most I, I think if all businesses are interlinked, 
there's going to be some impact to all businesses that they didn't have any physical um, impact from the events of the last week. Um, because, you know, they could be, a, you know, you could be a creditor in relation to a person that was impacted. And if that person is not able to pay you any longer because, uh, you know, their businesses have been, or they've lost everything, and you now have a, and you're unable to collect on your debt, um, you should be able to claim the deduction for a bad debt, uh, provided that amount was included in income previously. Now, from a capital gains tax perspective, uh, the write off of capital assets. So, for example, buildings. Now, remember I said previously that if, you, if a building was destroyed, unfortunately, a scrapping allowance is not, uh, is not claimable on that, even if you could claim building allowances on that building. The write off of that building or and other capital assets that were destroyed would qualify as a capital loss. And the thing with capital losses is that capital loss may be offset against capital gains realized, other capital gains that you realize in the current year and may be carried forward into your future years as well. So, you know, even if you aren't able to fully utilize the capital loss in the current year, you may carry forward that, that capital loss into, into a future year. Now, then moving on to insured losses. Um, and it, it, this is really applicable from a VAT perspective. It's applicable to insured persons that are VAT registered VAT vendors. Now, not all the businesses that have been impacted are VAT vendors, but where they are, it often comes as an unpleasant surprise that VAT is payable on insurance proceeds. So just bear that in mind um, that should you receive or be lucky enough to receive some insurance proceeds uh, uh, from, from SASDIA, uh, they and you're a VAT vendor, it's likely that you're going to have to account for VAT, output VAT on that, uh, on that receipt. Now, where this comes from is Section 88 of the VAT Act. And the principle is, is because short-term insurance is subject to VAT at the standard rate, and the insured person may claim the input VAT on the insurance premiums, the receipt of an indemnity payment from the insurer is subject to output VAT. Right? There is an exception to this, and that exception is where the goods that are covered are um, are goods on which you could not claim a VAT input credit in the first place. So for example, if one of the assets that were destroyed was a motor car as defined, which you could not claim VAT on previously, um, the, the receipt of the insurance uh, uh, payout on that would not be uh, subject to VAT. But typically for other assets like, uh, you know, building uh, damage or, um, you know, damage to stock or to, um, uh, to your to equipment, generally that would be payable on that. So something to bear in mind uh, when, when the time comes for insurance payments, uh, when pay, insurance, pay, insurance payments are received. And this is something that SARS, I think, will be on the lookout for. Um, you know, um, I know that SARS has had projects in the past where they obtain list of payments um, made by insurance to um, insurance companies to various recipients, and they go and follow up and find out whether those, uh, you know, the, the relevant declarations have been made in the VAT returns. Then moving on to the income tax and the CGT consequences then of receiving an insurance payment, right? Now, the tax consequences depend on the nature of the insured risk and whether the payment fills a hole in profit or capital. And those words fill a hole actually comes from a court case, the Burma Steamship case, where the court looked at what was, uh, you know, the underlying uh, thing that was meant to be compensated by that insurance payment, right? Now, typically income tax will arise on insurance proceeds to compensate for the loss of stock because that's regarded as floating capital. It's, part, it's you know, it's, um, it's an asset by, through which you generate income. So generally the insurance proceeds to compensate for the loss of stock would be taxable in full, but then you should get the cost of the stock uh, as a deduction as well. Right? From, uh, for compensation for loss of profits, um, if you were lucky enough to be covered for that under SESDIA, uh, any pay payment that you get for the loss of profits through business interruption will be, taxable, will be taxable in full because it's to compensate for profit you would have otherwise made that would have been fully taxable in any event. And then insurance proceeds on depreciable assets will give rise to recoupment of allowances previously claimed. So for example, you had a heister that was written off uh, to say 50,000 Rand, the original cost was 200,000, and then you receive a 70,000 Rand payment. Um, the, the 
the difference between the 70,000 and the 50,000 grants that you've got on hand um, in your, or your written of value in your books will be regarded as a recoupment and will be fully taxable. Right? So something to be aware of, it's like, it's considered to be like a normal disposal of an asset. Then from a capital gains tax perspective, um, you know, the, the scrapping, the loss or the destruction of an asset is regarded as a disposal. Um, and capital gains tax will arise with insurance proceeds exceeds the base cost of the capital assets. So for example, you had a building that costed a million rand. Um, it was insured for a replacement cost of 2 million rand. Uh, the insurance paid out the 2 million rand. You would have had a capital gain of a million uh, that, uh, that, would, uh, uh, that you would need to account for. Then with regard to timing of the disposal. So, you know, the event has happened now in July. And just say, for example, you've got a, it's an, a business that's got a December year end, uh, but the insurance only pays out in February next year. The timing of the disposal will only be February next year. So that is the point at which you would need to include it in that it will be in that financial year that you need to include that insurance proceeds um, as, a, as part of your disposal of that asset. So something just to be aware of in terms of timing. The good thing is that you will not need to, uh, to account for any CGT until you actually receive the cash. There's something that's it's quite nice uh, from the sense of, of providing relief. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get an insurance uh, payout from, uh, from the insurer and, um, and you intend reinvesting uh, those insurance proceeds in replacement assets, there is rollover relief provided for in our tax legislation. Now, uh, the way it works is that it doesn't give you completely re relief. What it does is it, it defers the income tax and the CGT conse consequences on the compensation received. Now, it's only applied at the election of the taxpayer. So you can decide, no, I'm not going to do that because administratively it's going to be too much of work. Uh, I'd rather just you know, take the tax consequences of insurance payment upfront. Or alternatively, if you intend rebuilding the business and you're going to be you know, investing in replacement assets, then you can elect not to be taxed immediately on receipt of those assets, provided such in, certain requirements are met. Now, those requirements, uh, firstly, there has to be an involuntary disposal of an asset. Um, and in this case, we do have that. Uh, you know, nobody that lost any, uh, any of their assets through the, the unrest did so voluntarily. Um, so, you know, I think that requirement definitely would be met. Um, the taxpayer must receive compensation at least equal to the base cost of that asset. Now, it's important to know what the base cost is. Uh, the base cost would be your acquisition cost of your asset, plus any cost of improvement, uh, plus um, any um, uh, you know, um, cost in the acquisition or disposal of that asset. For example, if you had transport costs related to you know, bringing in specific equipment into the country and so on, uh, it excludes borrowing costs and the cost of maintenance, which generally would be deductible costs anyway, and that's the reason for that. And it's reduced by expenditure allowable as a deduction. So in other words, your way and tier allowances. So provided that the proceeds that you receive are at least equal to your written down value of that, star, that, that asset, you can elect uh, to use the resistance rollover relief provision for, that, for the replacement of that particular asset. You must satisfy the SARS that the full proceeds will be reinvested in the replacement asset. So for example, uh, if you had a building that burnt down, um, in my previous example, I had you know, the 2 million rand um, uh, insured value, and that's the amount that the ins insured person received. The 2 million rand um, must be used to, 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 um, to build the replacement asset. Um, so you need to satisfy SARS on that criteria. The replacement assets may be movable or immovable, tangible or intangible. So SARS doesn't actually prescribe what kind of asset you need to, to um, invest in. A further requirement is, is that the replacement assets cannot be personal use assets. So in other words, you cannot take those, uh, the, the insurance uh, payout and decide, well, I'm going to improve my personal home or buy a fancy car instead. So those, those assets will not qualify. The contract for the acquisition of the asset must be concluded within 12 months of the date of disposal. Now, remember what I said about date of disposal? The date of disposal is the date you actually receive the indemnity payment from the insurer. And in my previous example, I said, you know, if the insurance pays you out, say, in February next year, you know, it would be 12 months from February next year that you would need to enter into the contract for the acquisition of the new asset. So you do have some 
time, uh, so some leeway in terms of time that SARS has provided. The replacement assets must be brought into use within three years of the disposal. So within three years from February next year, in my example, you need to bring the asset into use. So in other words, like for example, the building that I was talking about, you take the 2 million rand insurance proceeds that you received, you contract with a construction company to build the building and it needs to be brought into use within three years of that, uh, of February next year, right? Now, if there's a problem in the sense that, you know, there's some time delay, they, you can't get, um, uh, you know, you can't enter into the contract on time or you cannot, um, you know, bring the asset into use on time, SARS can extend the above time periods by six months. Right? So SARS has some leeway, but you'll have to apply, obviously, for that to happen. Now, what are the tax consequences of doing this? Right? So firstly, I mean, if you receive the insurance pay, uh, payment and you decide to apply this particular section, you don't pay tax on that insurance payment immediately. So what would happen is in the year of receipt, you'll say, look, I'm, I'm using this provi particular provision. Uh, and so you don't pay any income tax on CGT upfront, right? You, you then meet the, you get, get into the contract to acquire the asset and the, the replacement asset is then brought into use. And depending on whether that asset is depreciable or not, the, the tax consequences are a bit different. The basic principle is that if it's a depreciable asset that you're buying, right? So just say it's a building that's a commercial building that's been built and now qualifies for Section 13 point allowances. So you're going to be writing off that building over 20 years. Then what would happen is that you would recognize any uh, recoupment uh, on your previous building plus uh, any CGT on the insurance proceeds over the same 20 year period. So in other words, you would reduce, effectively reduce your building allowances over a 20 year period. So the way this rollover relief works is that it times, it defers your capital gain and in, uh, recoupment on, on your insurance proceeds uh, to be in line with the depreciation on your new asset, right? Now for non-depreciable capital assets, um, and these could be, for example, maybe buildings are built on leased property that do not qualify for allowances. Um, you know, all that would happen in that case is that you would reduce the base cost of the asset rather than um, phasing in the, the recoupment or the way and tear uh, or the capital gain over the period of depreciation. Then a few other considerations to be aware of. Um, you know, if a company, uh, if, so now, uh, let me take a step back. You know, the businesses that have been impacted are in various forms. You'll have sole proprietors, you'll have guys that were, uh, you know, are trading maybe through trusts, and you'll have some that were trading through companies or CCs, right? Now, particularly in the case of a company, uh, if a company does not receive or accrue income from trade for a full financial year, assessed losses brought forward would be forfeited. So something to just be aware of. So if you uh, you know, just say, for example, uh, traded through a company and you now have, uh, you know, everything is virtually destroyed and you have to start from scratch. And then you, you're you still thinking about whether to, uh, to actually continue rebuild or you're waiting for the insurance to be adjudicated. So you cannot do anything in the meantime because you don't have access to capital. So just be aware that if your year end comes and then for the next financial year, the company does not accrue any income from trading, you, you're going to lose any losses that you would be able to claim now. So it's something just to be aware of, right? So it's important to continue trade by carrying on active steps. And, and those active steps could be collecting debtors, negotiating with banks, setting up new trading facilities, but just make sure that the company also earns some level of income during that time as well. Then with regard to all businesses, you know, uh, I mean, you know, business has been interrupted uh, and whether it's a company or a sole proprietor or a trust that's been trading, you know, if you, if you cannot trade for a temporary period of time, you know, um, our position is that the temporary closure, uh, uh, you know, the expenditure incurred during that temporary closure, for example, um, you know, paying for, uh, you know, uh, rentals, or paying for utilities on the rates on the, on the property or, and, and so on, that would still be fully deductible. And if active steps are, are taken to continue business, trading activity would be taking place. So, you know, um, you know the temporary cessation or temporary closure will not result in non-deductibility of expenditure incurred during that period. 
then unfortunately, I think a lot of uh, redundancy costs or voluntary severance packages are going to have to be paid uh, in order to reduce staff complements during the time that companies or businesses are not able to trade. And I mean, there are some tax consequences related to those as well. Now for costs that are legally payable, for example, the severance payments due by law, for example, the one year, one week for every year of service that is payable to employees, um, our view is that you can claim the deduction on that, even if uh, you, know, you decide that you're going to shut down the business thereafter, right? Other voluntary redundancy costs, so for example, not prescribed by law, but which the company out of their own policies and uh, you know, have decided that uh, they provide as, as employment benefits can be deducted if the employee contract provides for it, or it's the policy, employment policy of that business uh, to make these kinds of payments. Right? So even though it's not prescribed by law, uh, you can, uh, you know, for example, if you if you say, you know, to alleviate hardship to these employees, you'll pay them a month, an extra month of salary, uh, you know, uh, uh, before you let them go. And then where voluntary payments are made to employees while they're temporarily, temporarily unable to work because the business premises, for example, has burned down completely and they cannot actually provide their services. But the employer out of their own decide to pay them a portion of their wage or salary for that period. Um, and it's done with the intention of hanging on to the employees because they're good ones and you want to re-employ them at a certain point in time. Those costs will be deductible as well. Because remember, usually to get a deduction, you need to have, it needs to be linked to the earning of income. Right? In that period of time, you're not earning income, but it, it's the view with the, uh, you're doing it with the view to the future. So in that case, I think it's a good argument to say that that amount, all those amounts would be deductible. And something just to note, the PAYE deductions would still be required on any payments made to these employees. So, you know, severance costs and so on would still, you know, you'd need to apply for the various directives uh, to SARS for any PAYE deductions. So, you know, for me, this is, uh, this is all that, um, uh, I'm covering today. It's it's obviously not going to be the full spectrum of all the tax issues that businesses may face in this period, but just a few things that we wanted to highlight. Um, I do want to uh, highlight to you that you know uh, if businesses are require um, advice, whether it's general legal advice or insurance policies or uh, tax advice, uh, particular to their scenario. You know, uh, we are uh, we will we'll be able to assist on a pro bono basis. Uh, you know, it's from a from a tax perspective. Um, you know, in, in those if you do not have that um, those skills available to you or you, that advice available to you, um, you certainly can reach out to Bowman's via Amal uh, or Minara, and we'll be happy to assist where we can. Thank you, yes, Go ahead, Faisal. Quite a comprehensive uh, presentation. Just letting the uh, participants know that we are recording this uh, session and it will be available uh, by tomorrow. So we have one more speaker and I'm going to hand over to Shabir to introduce the next speaker. Faisal, thank Please. you very much. Uh, Yasmin, I think it'll be well worth all the participants. Yasmin, thank you very much for that presentation. Very comprehensive indeed. And I think uh, just from some of the chats, uh, we're getting a lot of requests uh, for the kind of recording as Faisal has mentioned. I just got introduced to someone yesterday uh, via, from a work point of view, and I thought it's probably appropriate for them to address us today and they've agreed. Raisa Khan, she's previously was at Weber Wenzel as a uh, associate, and she worked at uh, Marsh and McLennan, one of the international companies as senior legal counsel. And she's currently the senior legal counsel at Aon. Uh, having just been introduced to her yesterday, I felt it's probably appropriate uh, to get her, uh, her views, uh, taking into account some of her international experience. So, Raisa, over to you for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Um, good morning and assalamu alaikum to, to all the attendees. Uh, as Shabir mentioned, I was just introduced to Shabir yesterday. Um, I think from, uh, you know, just upfront, um, the guidance that I can give is basically not from a legal advice perspective or a broking perspective, but surely from the perspective of having dealt with contentious claims, uh, both on an international basis, but also locally. Um, 
I think what is most, most of the bright presentation has provided some good guidance on, on how to approach, uh, you, you know, submitting your claim and notifying your claim. But I think of utmost importance having dealt with contentious claims. Uh, and as we navigate through these claims with SASRIA is that um, full and complete disclosure is important. Um, qualification as well as quantification of your claim um, is important. So when you do discuss these claims with your insurance advisors and your brokers, make sure that you qualify and quantify a claim. It should not be the mindset that it's a given that this was a protest action uh, and, and, and it's common knowledge and therefore uh, I can just submit my claim and it will be processed. I think it is very important to sit down with your advisors and your, over a call or email, whatever uh, suits you best, but to have that discussion up front um, to describe exactly how your businesses were uh, interrupted and the, the damage that was suffered uh, during these riots. Uh, the second most important thing is, as mentioned in the Bright presentation, that there are different classifications uh, in terms of the, of the peril and damage that is not classified as rioting and public interest and commotion may not fall under the SASRIA policy and would probably fall under your commercial policy. To that end, again, my guidance is speak to your insurance advisors, speak to your brokers and ask them uh, in that instance, where and how do I uh, notify a claim? Is there other options? Are there other options? I think notification of a claim is ultimately important. So where you do not have the SASRIA claim or SASRIA, sorry, SASRIA cover under your policy, my suggestion is still approach your insurance advisors and your brokers for that advice on, uh, on submitting or notifying a claim. Um, and again, uh, full and correct risk information. So those that are intending to uh, get the SASRIA cover for, for future purposes, again, full disclosure of risk information is crucially important. Um, there are SASRIA regulations. So as we navigate through the claims process, uh, what is important to note is that these claims will be subject to those policy terms and conditions and regulations. Um, as Aon, and I think a message from Aon and the industry, uh, it is a difficult time. And, and as, as I speak for Aon, I can say we're here to support uh, all Aon clients uh, as we progress and navigate through these claims. Thank you, Shabir. Thank you, Raisa. Um, so just, just a, a note about the um, Minara and Amal help desk. Uh, we have uh, created this help desk to assist uh, whoever that needs our help and we'll try our best as possible. So if you can email info at amal.org.za or minara, kzn at minara.org.za, we'll put these details up uh, as well. So we have a few questions and I'm going to- Sorry, Faisal, just activate I'm your camera. Just, uh, go to the board. Uh, Faisal, camera. Okay. So I'm going to go through the more important questions um, as they come through. So the first question was uh, from Tanish, combine your questions. Um, does your fixed assets form part of stock because your policy only has stock as, as an item? Um, Tadik, if you can answer that. You're on mute, Tadik. So you, you were breaking up a little bit. If I can just repeat the, if I think I understood the question is that there are fixtures and fittings that were damaged in the process, but the cover was for stock only. Is that, was that the question? Correct. So, so what is important, I think Raisa has touched on it as well, is that in terms of your policy, um, there is specific things that are covered and other things that are not covered. Now, um, you know, it, it is probably sad and regrettable sometimes in these circumstances that we find ourselves in because it's not things that is the norm and things that we look forward to at all in terms of what has taken place. But um, if effectively, if you've taken cover for stock, stock is a specific item, meaning that it is, it is the kinds of things that you are selling within the business. It carries a specific value and that is the productivity of the business. And if that is the only thing that has been insured, then in terms of an insurance policy, 
that is what will be paid out for in terms of the deliberation and the quantum. However, I think I take the point from Raisa as well that it is, it is up to the insured to put that claim forward and each claim is dealt with on its own merit within the insurance company or dealt with by SASRIA. So, you know, at the end of the day, that's the process I think that needs to be followed. Thanks, Rick. Um, in terms of the, uh, that SASRIA will take to settle claims, can you give us an indication? Sorry, I, I didn't get that. The timeline in terms of settling claims by SASRIA. Yeah, so look, it's a, yeah, look, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one at the moment because obviously, firstly, um, you know, if, if it's smaller claims, that they'll try to settle them as quickly as possible. I think um, from a Sassaria point of view, they understand the urgency of getting business back into operation and getting them operating as soon as possible. It's in their interest and it's in the client's interest as well to get the client back up and running as soon as possible. But I think one can appreciate, and I know as a matter of fact, that SASU are putting on additional people to assist and to, to try and get through this claim. But if you look at the, 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 the enormity of the task at the moment, then it is going to take a little bit of time because the number of claims um, that has come in is probably going to overwhelm them initially. So I think there's going to have to be a little bit of patience with the, with, the, with the fact that they will try to get through things as soon as possible, but it, it will take a little bit of time. The exact timeline, it's, it's very difficult at this point in time because obviously logistically it is not even possible to get to some of those places to see what is actually taking place to assess the damage or to adjust the damage. But know that from, from information that we have, SASRIA are certainly focused on trying to settle claims as quickly as possible and they're putting extra people on to try and, and help to assist that process. I think it'll be important uh, um, for people to ensure that the required documentation is put to correctly before they submit the claim to yeah. uh, settlement. So the next question is on business interruption. You mentioned that business interruption is covered by SASRIA. Uh, the question was whether your policy, your existing policy, the uh, business interruption, does that also apply? So, so in I'm terms repeat of that, business interruption. No, no, it's okay. I, I think I got it. I think it's important to understand that first and foremost, I, I think I touched on it. The underlying policy does not provide cover for any form of political or standard riot, unfortunately. Everything that, would, in terms of what we've seen in terms of the unrest, would typically be covered by a SASRIA policy. That SASRIA type of cover would be excluded under your typical insurance policy. So, so the short answer to that is no, it's not covered under your standard policy. It is the SASRIA policy that would pick up uh, that form of, of cover. But I think you touched on one important aspect, uh, um, Faisal, and that is um, to try and speed up claims. The important thing is to get your documentation in order as soon as possible. Give them as much as what you can so that it helps them in terms of being able to assess quickly. The more you can provide in terms of information, the better it is for the insured because you know, if they've got all the information, all the documentation that they need up front, it will help to speed up the claims without a doubt. Um, so one of the questions was, how would the assessor um, assess the claim if a cleanup process is taking place? Um, let me try and understand that. How would the assessor assess the claim in terms of? So the let's say the building has been looted and, and there's lots of damage. And now you go through the process of teaching and then the assessor comes through uh, to assess the claim, for example, 
it's already been cleaned up, etc. I would suggest take photos before you clean up. Well, yeah, look, I mean, that, that is a good suggestion um, for the, particularly for the insured, very good suggestion. But at the same time, look, there is, there's been a lot of coverage uh, of, of the events taking place, of uh, the damage that has taken place. It probably is picked up somewhere, but I think a very good suggestion from your side, if there's cleanups taking place, take some photographs, keep it available for the assessors. They will, they will obviously, with the experience that an assessor has, he will be able to assess and see what has taken place within the entire area or within a shopping center. They will assess from that point of view and they will be able to, to get information. And in fact, they have information up front as well. You know that, you know, with all the damage that's taken place, and I think it's a common question from quite a few of our participants, what happens now if that equipment was damaged and you don't have access to the information, as an example is given, and that was on his PC and that's damaged and he doesn't have that information. So I think that's a common question as well. And also with regards to invoices from suppliers, etc. So something that... Yeah, look, that, that, is, that is certainly an issue that, that, that could, could occur. And in fact, to be honest with you, even from a normal insurance perspective, it does happen where we have a normal fire and invoices are destroyed in the fire or records are destroyed. Importantly is the fact that if you're running a business, obviously there is uh, audits that take place. There's accounts that take place. You nine times out of 10, the business has got an accountant or a bookkeeper, and it's important to be able to provide information from the bookkeeper side or from the accountant side to be able to substantiate that claim. Now, insurance companies do accept that after a period of years, certain things do uh, sometimes get lost. In a fire, things will get lost. It's, it's, it's about the, the, uh, the, the, the quantum being substantiated to some kind of extent, even if there's estimates involved, but the, 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 the quantum must be substantiated in some form or, or another to be able to give the evidence that, that that was the amount of things that were carried within the business. Thanks, Rick. Next question. Would suppliers and customers extension be covered? Sorry, I'm not picking up your question. You're breaking up a little okay. bit. Would suppliers and customers extend? This question is from an insurer. Typically, in terms of the SASTIA policy, it, it, if you looked at those exclusions that we had there, it does not pick up anything that has happened um, at another place. It only covers things that happened within your particular uh, area and within your particular business. So what hasn't been delivered or what is still on order or things like that will typically not be picked up by a SASRIA policy. Um, it covers the, the specific perils and it covers the specific um, area. If you've got um, uh, you within a certain area, you can get that uh, imminent danger cover or within your own particular premises, whatever is damaged and whatever has taken place at your premises. Thanks, Sadiq. Another question is that um, the limits that are placed, is it placed on the basis of your accepted statutory limit that's applicable? So if, for example, you got your stock in, uh, insured at 1 million rand on your standard policy, is that the limit for statutory purposes? So, so good question, uh, Faisal, because what is important is that, so in, in a typical situation, you've got an underlying policy with an insurance company, and let's say you got a million rand insured on, for, for your contents under, under the underlying policy. That, is, that should be the same amount that is insured on Sassaria. Uh, and, and the important thing there is that if that is not the same amount, then, then obviously you, your amount that you would be able to recover from SASIA would be less. But typically um, an insurer would insure for whatever the underlying policy is. If you've taken SASIA cover, 
they normally would ensure for the for the value that is within the underlying policy. Thanks, um, they can tell me. Uh, we have another question uh, from our online. Um, they have a shop in a in a in a mall, and they've been insured, uh, but now the um, broker has informed them that they don't have Sestia. Is it automatic that you have Sestia, or is it that you have to add on Sestia? Yeah, that, item? yeah that's also a very good question uh, because. Sastria is not an automatic. Um, it is a cover that is optional because, you know, obviously it carries a premium like an insurance policy that is uh, optional. Sastria is an optional cover. It is not compulsory by any stretch of the imagination, unfortunately. Um, so what has to happen is you have to actually request Sastria cover. Um, if, like you, you take out an, a short-term insurance policy with an insurer, you would then have to request the SASRIA cover from the broker as well to ensure that you've got both the SASRIA cover as well as the underlying insurance cover. Um, just following up on the previous question, um, so if you insured and, and, and it's, you've got the fire and a theft amount, uh, would the fire of the building has been damaged or burnt? or will the theft amount be applicable uh, in terms of your stock? So are you saying where, where there's no Sassaria involved? No, would Sassaria, sorry, the previous question that I asked. Uh, so basically um, you are insured, you have Sassaria, and then you have in terms of your policy, uh, the limits between fire and theft. So, Which, so so in terms of SASRI, your SASRI does not provide theft cover. So, so remember, as I mentioned earlier on, SASRI in its, in its, under its perils does not provide for theft or looting. What it does provide for is damage. The damage takes place if there is looting that follows the damage. That looting is covered. But straightforward looting and theft is not a SASRI cover at all. It's covered in your underlying policy, but remember your underlying policy excludes Sassaria cover. So if it's a riot, it would fall within Sassaria. If, if for example, they, 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 they damage your premises or they burn the premises and they loot the entire premises of stock and that full cover is provided for Sassaria, then the theft cover would be picked up there in terms of the looting because it follows an insured Sassaria peril. Okay, Farad Parak wants to know if I have a building which was tenanted and now the building is burnt, can I claim for loss of rental income? So in terms of Sassaria, uh, you'd, you'd have to put that sort of claim to Sassaria uh, because there are certain things that are covered and certain things that are not covered in the business interruption section. I haven't gone through all the inclusions and the exclusions. There, there are quite a, a bit of technical things that are involved in, in the covers itself. And what would have to go through the exact SASRI uh, cover that was taken to, un because you see in terms of business interruption, you get different types of cover for business interruption. You got your gross profit, you got standing charges, you got revenue, you got rentals, and it all depends on how the underlying policy was structured versus what was taken out via the SASRI uh, cover and what SASRI uh, does provide in terms of that business interruption section. Thank you. Um, does the average clause apply with regards to staff your claim? Average would apply in terms of um, if there is under insurance, yes. Um, it, is, it is part of the underlying policy and it would follow the same principle um, in terms of uh, average across the board. The one thing that, that I must be clear on is that, look, different policies are structured differently from an underlying perspective. So it's important to understand that it's not easy from, from our side to be able to tell you what, is go what, what exactly would happen in terms of a claim because of the fact that it is your underlying policy that 
essentially starts the process and then moves across into the Sassaria side. So Sassaria follows your underlying policy and there are certain things that are specific to Sassaria and certain things that are specific to their underlying policy. So it is important. This is where your broker's expertise and professionalism comes in, in terms of getting the correct advice, the correct support and the correct assistance from the broker at this point in time. I agree that 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 would be critical. I think in terms of uh, your claim as well. Um, so one of the things that I'm uh, sorry, there's a question for Yasmin here. So we'll give you a break, um, uh, Sadiq. Um, so the question that Vlad has is: uh, For what period will the bank statements uh, be required for that VAT return? You mean to reconstruct, I suppose. So look, I mean, all your bank statements uh, should be available for the, sorry? Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, Faisal, you were saying something? Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, um, when it comes to bank statements, uh, you know, you use that as a basis maybe to, as third party information, if all your, your primary source documentation, like invoices and so on have been destroyed, right? Um, so it's not going to be your only source yeah. of information uh, that you're going to use. Are you probably going to use different sources of information to reconstruct some records, right? Um, and bank statements are going to be one of those sources. You could use your creditor statements. Um, you know, if you're running a primarily a cash business and you don't deposit all your cash, your business, your bank statements are going to give you a full reflection of, of, your, of your business, if you think about it. And SARS would be aware of that. Um, so you'd have to look at uh, your bank statements, and it wouldn't be for any specific period because remember, you're required to keep uh, documentation for at least seven years under the Companies Act. And in any event, if you lose your bank statements, you can uh, obtain copies from your bank. So it's going to be easily obtainable, probably at a cost, but still obtainable, right? So you're going to be able to get information going back at least several years from the banks um, to, to be able to provide that trading history to SARS. Uh, SARS will also look in uh, that in conjunction with your previous VAT uh, uh, returns, your previous in income tax returns. Uh, they look at um, you know, what other third party information they can get uh, to, to establish whether the estimate you've come up with is a fair and reasonable one. Right. So you know, if so you don't have the source been... documentation, sorry. Carry on, Faisal. Sorry, done, yes, me. Yes, okay, so right. the next question, yeah, that was the only question for you, Yasmin, and yes, I agree that you will be able to uh, be retrieved from your suppliers, from your bank, etc. And one of the questions that have been asked is, what can we provide as evidence? And I think uh, th this is basically the answer to it, that you're going to have to go back uh, uh, and also in terms of your sales system, we would assume that you have some sort of uh, backup or information. I know it's going to be a challenge for small businesses with regards to this. Um, Sadiq, one question uh, Muhammad Qasim has come up with is, um, can you elaborate further on the specific business interruption cover that SESRIA is responsible for? Does it pay based on the conventional insurance method or uh, perhaps you can inform us on this? So, so I didn't understand the question properly. Um, the question is to elaborate further on specific business interruption is responsible for. Does it pay on the conventional insurance method? So, so the um, the SESIA cover certainly follows the underlying policy. And so therefore it would use the sort of standard ways in terms of how the assessments are done for business interruption. Um, it, uh, again, it, it is dependent entirely on what covers um, the, uh, the underlying policy has and, um, and what, uh, what quantum is placed within the underlying policy. Um, it covers all the, the, the aspects that is technically provided by SASIA, but it follows the, it, there's, there's a standard way in which business interruption uh, covers would be um, assessed. And, and it's pretty much the same way that they would do the underlying policy. 
However, there are certain things that are covered and certain things that are not covered. Now, in terms of uh, the underlying policy, that is the important part in terms of ensuring that the what, what is in the underlying policy is provided for in terms of the Sastria cover that is within the ambit of Sastria. And uh, the, 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 the principles are pretty much the same in terms of how they operate here. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Dick. I think we are running out of time. And, and uh, I think we're going to stop it there. What we would do is if there's any unanswered questions, we'll... we'll um, Try and send to. I think if you can email it to us on those email addresses uh, provided, we'll try and. And it is 25 to 12 now. I think um, we've overstepped our time. We're supposed to complete at, at 11:30. So I'm going to call on um, Sorry Suleiman, but I'm not sure if he's online uh, to do the vote of thanks. Sorry, over to you. Uh, Thank you. Our guest speakers, Sedek Abrahams, uh, Yasmin Suleiman, Raisa Khan, uh, Shabir Chuhan, the CEO of Al Baraka Bank, Mohammed Kaka, also from uh, Al Baraka Bank, directors of the Minara Chamber, members of Amal, and participants. Good morning. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace and blessings upon all of you. I suppose we need a lot of the peace and blessings uh, at this point in time. Amal and the Minaro Chamber sister organizations uh, extend a grateful thanks for it, to you for participating in this, this relevant uh, webinar. I think it's a brilliant webinar. The topic was very relevant. Insurance claims, accounting, and tax probably needs a full day to really comprehend uh, the entire process. I mean, it's been quite, quite uh, informative, educational, and, and of course, uh, you know, quite interesting as well. And I think we, people are going to need a lot of help here, obviously. Uh, I believe that this webinar has just scratched the surface and there's a recommendation, as you know, as it was mentioned by Shabir and Faisal, to set up the help desk to support and guide small businesses. Uh, many of whom, or most of us really, we haven't been through this, so we all have no clue of where to start and where to end with this process. Of course, the process will be, there will be a minefield uh, of bureaucracy, which we'll have to overcome. And I think uh, one will have to bear with us, although we're setting up the help desk, but I think we're going to be inundated with so many different uh, issues here. Uh, I'm not sure if they even, uh, if I think Asla Maito was talking about the, the time that you have to claim. I don't know whether it's about 30 days, but we need obviously to uh, speak about that at some point. Um, as far as the vote of thanks, I think that's my role here. Both the Amal, uh, the Associate Muslim Attorneys, uh, sorry, Associate Muslim accountants and lawyers, as well as the Minara Chamber, really extend our sincere appreciation to Sedek Abrahams, who is the head of business support services, Bright Insurance Company, Raisa Khan, who's the senior legal advisor of Aon, and of course, Jasmine, who's always, always there to support the organizations. We always hear from her a couple of times a year. And maybe you guys are wondering, there's so many Sulemans here. I think it's Faisal and I are brothers, and Yasmin is a cousin of ours. As you can see, Suleiman's are quite uh, involved in so many different things. Uh, she's the executive in tax at Bow Bowman's, and, and we thank all of them for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you to Basil and Shabir for coordinating the program. It's a very interesting and relevant program. I'm not sure whether they have in mind to have a follow-up, but you obviously will be getting the recording. You've got the email addresses, and uh, from my side, that so I have nothing more to say, Jazakallah, except to, to, to actually acknowledge Mohammed Kaka and Balbaraka Bank for always providing the virtual platform. We, you know, we always impose upon them and they always provide that. So thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Balbaraka Bank. Um, as I mentioned, the recording will be circulated. Thank you once again from, from ourselves. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran to all. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.